When major institutions are suggesting that the Fed and other central banks have printed so much money that it can never be reversed, you know you have a problem. We have constantly been hearing about a recovery, but what exactly has been done? Central banks are still trying to stimulate, even though in all previous instances, central banks would wait for conditions to worsen to begin supporting the markets. This time, they never even stopped. The problem is that you cannot fix anything with central bank activity. It has been documented in 100% of cases that their actions only make matters worse. Good luck. You came here for the truth, so let me unveil that for you. I want to thank you for watching the Broken Record GPS. Today we are going to talk about what's happening with central banks. The most important topic, of course, related to the financial system, related to the monetary system. What's happening from top to bottom? I'm going to show you some charts. I'm going to show you some articles. I'm also going to show you how 2019 is a record outflow, showing record outflows from equities. Believe it or not, that's what we have seen so far, and the year is almost over. So let's get into it right away. Saxo Bank had this article here and I thought it was really important because it's really going to lead me into the rest of the video. We're talking about the central banks. So much liquidity has been injected in the stock market over the past years. It is now impossible to withdraw. Now think about what's happening here. We have a major financial institution talking about how this QE quantitative easing has really created a system in which cannot be reversed. Whenever you go this far, you inevitably fail. There's no other way to put it. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't want to hear that because all of their savings, their 401ks, their retirement accounts are relying on the fact that the Federal Reserve and that the other central banks can continue this policy forever. I keep hearing about Japan, keep hearing about China, how successful they have been over the years. But if we look at it, in fact, Japan has never returned even close to where they had been at their absolute peak. At the same time, we have have mounting problems inside of Japan and quite frankly a central bank that cannot admit when it has failed. Now according to Saxo Bank which I personally disagree with the only solution is to keep injecting liquidity which explains why around 60% of central banks are easing globally. I've shown you those statistics before but ultimately the solutions here are never going to work because they have already been doing so for 10 years that hasn't fixed anything. They always talk about the recovery Recovery, but quite frankly, that hasn't happened. Yes, the markets are up. Yes, unemployment calculated as part of the U3 by the BLS is near 50 year lows. But of course, the recovery hasn't happened. The detoxification has not occurred. He makes an interesting point here. The debt burden is not manageable if interest rates considerably rise. Policymakers are not ready to accept the social cost resulting from the end of the expansionary monetary policy. They can't pull that back knowing they're going to create a recession. And so they figured all we're going to do is monitor the fake inflation core PCE rate. As long as that stays around 2% or below, we can print as much money as we want. One of the biggest issues is that when they do this, of course, they create a widening gap in between the rich and the poor. And you have seen many, many people, not just in the United States, of course, we're looking at this all over the world, engaging in an uprising for one reason or another. People are stressed out, people are at the edge, and there is no possible way that this is ever going to get better. People are fighting over chicken sandwiches. What do you think's gonna happen as the real problems hit them in the face? Lastly, just wanted to note at the bottom here, there is no other alternative than stocks for investors seeking yield. And this is generally the consensus that we see in the mainstream media that investors need to buy stocks. It's great for the advertisers and of course this will continue to persist even through a recession. Out of market watch, Fed's balance sheet swelling. The lowest reported point of the Fed's balance sheet since the balance sheet normalization, which never happened, started was $3.7 trillion on August 28, 2018. The latest reported level is $4 trillion plus. That's close to a $300 billion QE added in only two and a half months since the disruptions in the overnight interest rate market started in September. 
September. If they keep doing this at the rate that they have been, their balance sheet is going to surpass where it was in the middle of next year. Now you gotta think about that for a second. This is being suggested, it's not QE. They are still today, literally today, trying to push out the propaganda that this is not QE. Look, I don't care what the hell it is. The balance sheet is expanding. They're printing up money on a regular basis. Whether it's $190 billion a day, as the Fed themselves have suggested, whether we look at what's on the repo pages on the New York Fed website, to me, it doesn't matter. All I know is that they're devaluing the currency on a regular basis. Interesting point at the bottom. I don't believe that the Fed's balance sheet is the only determinant of the level of the stock market, but it sure is a major factor. Balance sheet expansion is like printing money, but for financial institutions only. It does affect the monetary base, excess reserves, plus currency in circulation, which is the narrowest definition of money supply, M0. It basically causes asset price inflation without causing uncontrolled broad money supply growth, which is why it has not yet resulted in hyperinflation. They're making some interesting points here, and I wanted to just cover those for you quickly. You could see the major central banks, the Fed, ECB, the BOJ, and the PBOC, and their total assets over the years. Obviously, they have expanded dramatically. And based on what we've seen in all of these different statements, suggestions, and everything else, that they intend on going much, much higher in the months and years to come. So we'll see what happens exactly. Now, Neil Kashkari, I'm sure you're aware of him. Congress asked, who are you working for? This was during the financial crisis. And of course, nothing happened to this individual. Nothing happened to any one individual during the financial crisis, during this period, even though so many were guilty on so many levels. Kashkari echoed an idea mentioned by Fed Chair Jerome Powell earlier this week that policymakers may want to consider short-term yield curve control. Quote, it's worth analyzing the potential of yield curve control as yet another policy tool. There's more detail tell in here, but you have to think about this for a second. When you have a problem, how will you resolve it? If you have cholesterol problems, you can take a pill that will lower the cholesterol. But does that resolve your issue? The underlying issue is still there. If you have high blood pressure and you take a high blood pressure pill, have you resolved the root cause? And of course the answer is no. If people are unwilling to look beneath the surface, the problems will only get worse down the road. One of the most important factors for what's happening in the stock market right now is the fact that the volumes are so incredibly low. Reduced trading liquidity in US equities for the S&P 500 at an all-time low. You can see what has happened since the financial crisis. At the bottom, it just explains it. This is monthly data. Turnover as a ratio of trade volume versus free float market cap. Because we have all the stock buybacks taking place, they're the primary buyer. A lot of people are sitting on the sidelines. A lot of people are in cash. A lot of people are worried. They're not necessarily selling off everything, but they're kind of just hanging out. Now, their assets have appreciated. There's no doubt about that. If they've been hanging on to particular stocks or maybe their mutual funds, 401ks, and so on, they've watched those grow. But at the same time, they're very concerned, and rightfully so. S&P 500 total return breakdown. Fed's dovish shift in early 2019 allowed extraordinary PE expansion. There's a breakdown here. In the bottom right corner, you can see 20% on that in particular, and at the top, a plus 27% since January 29. The return has been incredible. There's no doubt about it. But think about this for a second. If we actually look at the data, where the money is moving to and from, we use the EPFR, among others. I'll show you more in a second, but I wanted to give you this first. Global equity and bond fund flows. Now, if you look closely at this, the blue lines are the bonds and the gray lines are equities. Now, you'll notice something very strange here. You got to think about this for a second. You are seeing right now a record level of money fleeing out of equities. Does that make any sense to you? We are watching stocks going to all-time record highs, and yet the money is flowing out. 
How does that make any sense? Well, there's some serious issues. Number one, we have what's happening with liquidity, okay? Big issues with liquidity right now. As I just explained, the volumes are very low. We have stock buybacks. Stock buybacks being the number one primary buyer of stocks since 2009. When you couple these two together, you get higher equity prices. Now, am I suggesting that people aren't buying stocks? Of course, people are buying stocks. But when we look at the actual data instead of just presuming something instead of just seeing what individuals are doing instead of saying that in my brokerage account I own this many shares of Amazon of course it's seven and so I know what's happening I know everything no no no. we have to actually look at that if we're not doing that we're just guessing we're presuming this tells you what you need to know and I hope that more people would actually wise up to this fact particularly those in the financial industry now, Lipper is another institution that also has a lot of good detail in addition to the EPFR. Fund flows into taxable bond funds and ETFs continue to swamp those in equity funds and ETFs. Equity funds have handed back $150 billion. This is year to date. It appears that many investors are heeding the warnings by some pundits that a recession is nearing. Fund investors have been in a risk off mode for most of 2019, despite stellar stock market returns injecting $430 billion into money market funds year to date. Now, this information, I think, is going to change, as they mentioned in the next line. Definitely in the short term, we are probably going to see money flowing out of there into equities for people who believe that this QE4 is going to push the markets higher and higher and higher. That very well could be the case. So we'll see what happens. Here's a chart that goes along with it. You can see the weekly estimated net flows, flexible funds, including ETFs. Right now, what we're seeing in the market is clearly in a state of being overbought. In the last week, we've seen the market come down a little bit, but we're right near the peak there, near all-time highs. And in my opinion, the euphoria has gone even beyond what we saw definitely in 2008, but also back in 2000. And just a couple of quick points before we finish the video, 50 stocks that most frequently appear among the largest 10 holdings of hedge funds. Take a guess. As always, we've seen this for years and years. The tech stocks are right at the top. Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, Alibaba, Alphabet, and so on. So much wealth is concentrated into such few companies. And of course, on the way down, this is going to hurt a lot of people. The bigger this bubble gets, the worse it's going to be. But then we have the other side of that. Wall Street strategists cool on tech stocks recommend steady income of financials for 2020. Most of these individuals here have absolutely no idea what you're talking about. Most of the data that we see is largely irrelevant. But what we need to do is take all of this information and try to put it to work. I always think it's important that people take their own advice. Don't take advice from anybody else. You take the raw data and you do what you think is right. I'm asked on a daily basis, where should I put my money? What should I do with my 401k and so on? I can't advise that. You need to make that decision for yourself because it needs to to be on you. If something bad happens, something good happens, you need to be responsible for it. You need to read up every single day. If you don't know what's going on on a daily basis, you'll definitely fall behind because the information passes by so quickly. So I want to thank you for watching the video. If you found it informative, hit that thumbs up button. If you want to build a business online, if you want to learn about passive income and e-commerce, this course has it all and it's free. I created an absolutely free e-course teaching you how to sell on Amazon. It's at theamazongps.com. If you are like 99.999% of people out there who never received the financial education that everyone needs to have, these two books have everything that you need. If you look in the links in the description, you will go over there to Amazon where you can buy this for yourself. Check it out. I know you'll like it. And if you want the audiobook, it's available at themoneygps.com. This is an incredibly important video, and if you haven't seen it already, definitely watch it. Just click on this, and I'll see you over there.